this time frame we're in. Uh, I'll just write it here. I see a now word about this. You're going to see this, and I don't understand, but I don't know if this involves a political person. I don't know if this involves a, a company. I don't know if this involves a vehicle in a specific scenario. I don't know exactly what this means, but there's something to do with the Volkswagen. Interesting. I saw that. I don't know what that's about. Um, I don't know if this has to do with a person, a company. I don't know if this has to do with um, proximity. Um, but there's something about an event or a situation and you'll find that either what they were driving what was going on a bigger picture than that involves this if you look close it'll involve this brand or this setting or something relating to that um, i'll come back to that if more comes to me but i saw this word i saw it so i don't even know if i'm spelling it right but this is what i know i, I know that that's the deal so when I'm looking at these things, I begin to recognize there's a lot happening in the world and we see it. Now, you've also noticed that I've, I've been drawing things about the whole year um, during this time here. I believe that we're going to really begin to see um, massive things beginning to happen both behind the veil and publicly. I think there's going to be exposure. The month of May has really been on my grid since the beginning of the year. Um, May all the way through, obviously, November. But May itself, there's going to be this narrative where things start to come out. And I think it may, sometimes these things happen behind the veil and then they expose themselves later. But I do believe May is a very pivotal, uh, monumental month. There's going to be decisions. And so much is going on. This is going to be tech decisions. There's going to be, um, my goodness, uh, oil platforms. There's going to be so much that happens around this. More and more airline issues and other industries of the same. Uh, the C will still yet have a lot to play into this. And there's just so much that's going on in this setting. And I believe that this is going to get more and more wild. You know, I, I keep talking about uh, X, right? That's not only the eclipse, all that, but then you see, uh, you know, our South African guy, Mr. Elon. And I gave this word about him being involved or having a great voice into the political arena. And that's a word that we just keep sharing. So we'll see where this unfolds, but this is going to be something we've got to pray about. I believe we're getting into this now. Interestingly enough, during this time, we're going to be doing a lot all the way up to this month or into this month with Noah's Ark. Now, again, we're going here. Why? Because it's the days of Noah word. That's what Jesus called the last days. I believe very firmly this is a reason that God's calling us into this is because there's a word of the Lord in this that I'm going there as a prophetic sign. So with all that's going on and then this eclipse narrative that's taking place, there's a lot happening. Now, let me let me draw a little more uh, for, for the purpose of clarity here today. And I think this will be very important. Let me let me see what I can do here. Um, let's just say. Let's just say that this represents where we are now as a as the earth and all that i began to see something that the lord i believe is saying is both going to be cataclysmic challenging and yet there's going to be uh how can i say um like shielded events or there'll be difficulty that breaks loose but then there's going to be also be these responses by the lord through prayer things that stop some of the events i began to see and i'm going to try to navigate out and sort of draw out what I saw here, I began to see the the world as it is. I began to see all these things happening um, on the, the world, so to speak. I started to see mountains, and these mountains represented, um, you know, um, 
I guess they represented nations, you know, these just mountains, different mountains around the, the earth, mountains that I began to see, you know, just in different locations, right? So I saw this and these represent mountains. And as I'm looking at this, I started to see that there was um, challenges and difficulty happening between nations. I started to see, you know, if this represents across the earth, I started to see nation uh, engaging nation. I started to see uh, nations from the other side of the earth engaging nations. Um, I started to see all this stuff where it was just really challenging. And and yet there was going to be, um, I don't know, just this this difficulty that was happening in this international level. And these represented mountains around the earth, uh, some smaller, you know, some, you know, monumental in size, some were just here. But I began to see different communications uh, between these nations and the, the represented by mountains. Um, in this same narrative, I began to see what would be, um, gosh, like events coming at the earth during this as well. I began to see these events coming at the earth. Let's say that represents like a storm uh, coming towards it, like a windstorm. Uh, then I began to see, um, you know, moments where fire would try to come against nations and devour things. And I thought, my goodness, what what's going to happen here? And I began to see um, just cyclone type events, you know, just just taking place towards all this. And then in this, the spirit of the Lord is saying, as my people are praying, there is going to be this blood bought responses uh, by the Lord God Almighty from these locations that would begin to intervene and like stop some of this this mess that's trying to explode at the the scene. And so I'm seeing this right now. It's like Matthew 24, wars and rumors of wars, difficulty. But I saw the Spirit of the Lord responding as we were praying to some of the, the violent activity and difficulty that's taking place in the earth right now. And it's trying to get at everything and hit it. And then right in the middle of it all, in the middle of all of it, here we see that there's this, this um, eclipse narrative, okay? So we see this pathway of this eclipse. And I heard the words after the eclipse. Okay? After the eclipse. It's like it's, there's something going on that's, that's going to bring an after effect of the eclipse. So much of what we're seeing here, I believe, will be into the month of, as we said, May, right? I believe this has to do with here, but really there's an after effect where a lot of this, this stuff is going to begin to manifest. Um, you see that happening with, of course, I'll just write this stuff in code. I think we're going to see an exposure and ties and even bribery too. Okay, you're going to see some of that. You're going to see more of the, the fang fang narrative, right? <laughs> and you're going to see that. So you got Red Dragon, that happening. You're going to see more of the corruption that comes to the forefront. Then you're going to see change that tries to manifest, but they might be stuck with what they've done. But you got to remember, even when they're like, boy, it's, you know, we don't like how, uh, you know, the Manchurians running things. It's pure political theater. Okay. If we really think that Manchurians running things, you got to wake up. Okay. He's not, run he's not running the show. It's pure theater with much of this. And that's what we're seeing here um, in all that we're looking at. Now, I heard these words. I heard the words national endurance. What does that mean? I believe if we endure, you know, like the word says here, sorrow may last for the night. But I do believe through this, joy, joy will come in the morning. And what does that mean? It means if we can hang on through this storm, there's going to be a right-sizing effect that begins to happen here. And this right-sizing effect is going to take place, and we're going to see like a national endurance. And this is for the righteous, okay? The righteous. We'll draw that in red for the blood, but I see righteous. Okay? Righteousness. 
Righteousness exalts a nation. And we've got to endure to begin to see righteousness be established again. But righteousness exalts a nation. Sin is a reproach to any people, Proverbs says. But I believe there's going to be this endurance and there's going to be victory. Okay? But the victory is going to be at great cost. Now, do I think the former guy is going to get back in? I got to tell you, there's a lot on the table that would say yes and no. There's a lot. And we got to pray. We got to act. We got to do corresponding faith. I think we need a miracle to see that happen. But I do believe God is going to release a miracle. And even though it looks like, you know, we're winning, there's momentum, there's a lot of shaking up even going in uh, some of our main uh, areas of leadership and house and all that. And it's, it's serious. Even the speaker, there's issues going on there right now that we've got to begin to recognize is not how we had hoped it would go. There's, there's some plans and nefarious activity going on there. So we got a lot to get into that I think is going to be very important. And we got to pray. We really do. You need to pray. And this is something I want to talk to everybody about is that I do see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I really do see another day. Let me, I'll draw that in green for hope, right? I do see for the nation, for the nations, another day. What do I mean by another day? I mean one more round. Now, it's going to be challenging, but I got to tell you, it's it's also going to be another day. There's there's another time coming uh, where we we will see some pushback. We'll be able to see some victories, but this is going to be a turbulent collision after collision after collision. And again, if I were to draw this now, changing this paradigm even though this is, you know, it's not true to scale here. If I were to draw the year one more time like this, if you remember, I drew the year, this being, you know, the beginning of the year, this is the middle of the year. This is, you know, by quarters, uh, quarter one, two, three, and four. I believe the spirit of the Lord is truly saying that they're going to talk about the money, the money, the money, the money all the way around. And I see more about the money happening. Maybe if we were to go all the way around this year, and into another year, like it's going to be a big topic then, okay? And now it's going to be that. But I, I have seen where it was this year, but then a year and a half out that we'd start to see um, like a right-sizing, like a challenge. We're kind of going to, going to know where the future is. So if we don't win this round, and I'm believing we will in Jesus' name, but if we don't, and we don't, and you, you got to prepare your heart for every outcome. You really do. But if we don't, I'm going to still be here. And we are still going to contend no matter what. Because you know what? Even if we don't, the church is here. Jesus is here. And it just means he's coming sooner. But at the, the end of the day, the bottom line is this, that it may be the last days for the way we've known this nation, uh, with, with depending on how this goes. If we don't win, and I'm talking sweep, uh, clean up, we're going to have some challenging days to really come to grips with in the coming two years. But if we do win, it's going to be a right-sizing and a challenging season like we've not quite experienced ever before in the history of this land. And I believe God is with us in a great capacity. You know, this here is the yoke that it's talking about in Isaiah 10, 27. Okay, let's say this represents the yoke. All right, this is the yoke. When we're looking at this in Isaiah 10, 27, notice it says that the yoke will be destroyed because of the anointing. But first of all, the anointing is also recognized uh, as fatness or just simply growth. You could say maturity. You could say that in your Christian walk, but for the purpose of what we're talking about here, let's say the anointing is, is doing these things, but really it's talking about growth. Now let me get to it even further. This begins to describe that there's an anointing that causes this yoke to lift off, first of all, the shoulder. Okay? You see it lifting off the shoulder. Then it talks about it being lifted off the neck. Okay? Okay? the neck, but ultimately it becomes destroyed. Okay? And that's what we want. But you notice the Word of God teaches us this, this same principle 
and you see that it talks about when seed goes in the ground, it bears fruit, and that is, of course, the Word of God. And the anointing grows this up, or the Word of God grows in good ground at what? At 30, 60, ultimately 100 Fold. Okay, now what do we mean by a hundredfold? Well, that's where the anointing begins to absolutely destroy, destroy the yoke. That's where you, you see it destroyed. You begin to destroy that yoke. Now, I'm going to explain what I'm talking about. I'm giving you kind of the groundwork for it, and then let me explain what I'm talking about. When the anointing destroys the yoke at 30, 60, and 100, well, first of all, at 30-fold, if we're really understanding what's going on here, if it comes off the shoulder, many people that experience a new form of liberty and the yoke begins to lift off their shoulder, they begin to say, whoa, I am free to run, right? They just begin to say, I'm free because they get a splash of the anointing of God and it lifts off their shoulders. Suddenly their burdens, their life, the things holding them down, the people that have tried to control them, whatever it is, you know, people, issues, that whatever's going on, maybe it's in debt to something, maybe it's a suppression from people or, or society or something, or maybe you've just dealt with something internally. Now, I'm, I'm using a, a wide variety of issues here, but all of it really is the same same interpretation, that when you start to feel lighter because the Spirit of God touches you, or you get more mature, or you get a level of revelation about a thing, suddenly that yoke of containment lifts. At 30-fold, you feel lighter. Because why? It comes off your shoulder. You start to have a lighter burden. You know, when many people say, oh, God gave me a burden, I understand that terminology, but we're not supposed to have a burden. It says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Cast your cares upon me because I care for you. When it begins to be lifted off the shoulder, that's at 30-fold, and sadly, many believers, they are here because suddenly they just feel lighter. And why is it sad? Because they're happy and content just being right here. I'm lighter. God set me free. I am free to run <laughs> with a burden on my neck. <laughs> I am free to dance, but I can't turn my head, right? Because what happens is they feel lighter, but suddenly if you keep growing, they don't realize there's more. It can go from 30 to 60 fold. And at 60 fold, at 60 fold, you begin to restore because why? If it lifts further, it loosens at the neck and when you get your neck loosened, suddenly no longer are you straightforward. Remember the movie Batman from the first one to the second one? I'm talking about the, uh, uh, the one with uh, Christian Bale as Batman. And the first movie, he can't turn his head. But in the second one, he's like, I need to turn my head. You know, it's, uh, and so they created a neck for him so he could look around. He had mobility. That's exactly what we're talking about here, where you see that change things. But the anointing grows, and suddenly you go from being lighter and mobile to you get your vision. Your vision is restored or your vision becomes a thing that you can begin to function in. So not only are you lighter, suddenly you have your vision. Now, most believers, most, they stay right here. They feel lighter. They got their vision. They can actually have some prophetic clarity. You could liken this to the sons of Issachar, which I could get to in a moment out of uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32, where it talks about they knew the signs of the times, 30-fold. They knew what to do about it, but they didn't know the next part, which I, maybe I'll get to, which really represents who are you with or your tribal alignment. But for our purposes here, look at this. You go from 30, which lifts the yoke off the shoulder, 60, which loosens the yoke at your neck. You get your vision back. But ultimately, it's God's highest and best and his greatest desire that you go to a hundredfold. And a hundredfold is where you're free. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. There's true and absolute liberty. And this is what God has for his people. Where there'd be liberty, victory, breakthrough, all of this. And suddenly, you're able to do everything God has called you and purposed you to do at a hundred fold. This is when you begin to start fulfilling your prophetic destiny. Your prophetic destiny is that you are destined to mature. Mature. So really what this is talking about is a level of maturity where you feel lighter, yes and amen. Yes, you have more vision, but suddenly you are now fully after the high call of God at a hundredfold. You're with the right people in the right place, not in bondage to things and running your race. But to get there, there's a little bit of a process. There's a process. Let's talk about that. So first of all, your anointing destroys the yoke. 
God's anointing, which is truly your maturity, your growth in the word of God. It is the being with the right people at the right place at the right time. Um, the fatness and the anointing, you just begin to outlast, outgrow, and bust this yoke off. So really, this yoke becomes destroyed. Now, I'm going to draw just for something else for you very quickly. This is going to be very important for us today. And I'm going to talk about your prophetic destiny and how it, how it relays into your life and what really matters and how you begin to go down that avenue. And I've drawn it before in this series, but I want to just revisit it for the purpose of the target we're going after today. So first and foremost, here we go. Let's talk about prophetic destiny one more time. I want you to see this, okay? So here we go. This is a line. You need to understand this graph. This is representing your destiny and all of it, okay? So this part here, it's talking about, let's just say, your prophetic destiny. This graph can work for a variety of things. Okay? Let's say that this line here represents your purpose. This line here represents time. Okay? And this could re mean days, weeks, months, years, decades, whatever it is, okay? Time. You've got your purpose, you've got time, and you have this, this line of prophetic destiny, okay? God's calling you to a purpose. And this is where it's at. It's like a, a, a calling. So we could say that there's a target you are meant to hit in life. There's a target God has for you. And this is your prophetic destiny. I should actually remove that arrow to not make confusion here. But your prophetic destiny really is here. This is what it's all about right here, this target. But in life, you have a purpose and then time. The clock never stops, stops ticking. Time waits for... Does time wait for you? Well, some, for some people, time is an emotion. <laughs> they just think, oh, well, yeah, it feels this way, so therefore I won't be on time. But time is an emotion for some people, but time really waits for no one. Some people are going to be late for the rapture, if you know what I mean, okay? Now, look at this. So when we're walking through this process of time waits for no one, that means that we owe it to Jesus, we owe it to God, and we owe it to the fellow brothers and sisters in the body of Christ to be, who, be with who we're supposed to be with, where we're supposed to be, when we're supposed to be there. And that really means you've got to develop. So you don't just do that. It means you've got to develop. It means you read your Bible every day, you do your disciplines, uh, you stay uh, out of offense, you stay out of wrong relationship, and when God assigns you to people, you be loyal to that. Now, it doesn't mean you don't love everybody and work with everybody, but it means you stay in the lane God's called you to be in, or you will have misfires or distractions, or your bandwidth will go down, and you really won't be hitting the target that you're anointed to hit. And you may only go to that 30-fold and feel lighter and say, I'm free, woo, but you'll never hit what you're called to do. And I don't know about you, but being that this life is very short, this life is going to run its course, and then we're in eternity, and this life is the smallest part of our existence, and then we go to eternity future, which we don't even fully understand, but the majority of our existence as created beings, sons and daughters of God, we're going to be spending in a whole nother paradigm, in a whole nother reality, and it matters what we do now so we know what we're going to be doing there. What we do now is what we're going to be responsible for there. In other words, what we've been faithful with here is what God's going to appoint us for there. And this is where it counts. So that's why this stuff matters. That's why I don't like wasting time with things that don't matter and, and dumb stuff. And a lot of people are addicted to uh, everything. Now, hear me. If you've got healthy relationships and healthy family and all that, it's good. But if you're addicted to family and you're addicted to stuff and you're addicted to people and, you know, people's opinions and all that, you're in bondage and you need to, you need to get free of that. And now that all of this has, has reason to it, and I'm saying that for, for a purpose, because sometimes you can also get on the legalistic side of things, and then everything you do is wrong, and nothing's enough, and you can get on that hamster wheel of performance. I'm not talking about that either. I'm talking about finding your grace lane, finding that balance of faith and grace for your life, and walking in it. Walk in it. Just walk in it. It doesn't say run and fight and scream. It says just walk in it. Run the course God's given you to run. And you do that, and grace will sustain you. It's not about being perfect. It's about doing that call and doing it with the best of your ability as an act of worship to the Lord, and you will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Now, let me just draw this. 
a lot of people, they start out their calling and they say, there's my vision. And they begin to go. And some people think that it's all just a matter of a linear line that you're just going to go and it's no problem. And bing, look, mom, I hit my vision. Have you ever had those kind of vision visionaries that, that tell things to people? Um, I don't know if you're around this, but you got to be careful who you tell your vision to. I'm thinking of the movie um, Despicable Me. Ever see that? Despicable Me, right? And he's a little guy and he's out in the yard and suddenly he's like, look, mommy, do a rocket, a picture of a rocket ship going to the moon, right? And then the mom's like, meh. <laughs> And he's like, hold on. The next scene shows him. He's like, look, mom, I made a rocket ship out of macaroni in the, in the front yard. They macaroni. And she's like, meh, <laughs> eh, whatever. The next scene is, look, mom, I built a real rocket ship. And it's in the backyard and he can take it to the moon. And she's just like, eh. <laughs> And, and a lot of people are like that. I call those people dream auditors. Dream auditors. It's like, you have a vision? You have a dream? You thought you did until you told it to me. And now I'm going to crush your soul with my stupidity because I've never done anything. Therefore, who do you think you are to do anything? You say you have spiritual gifts? You say you want to do something magnificent for God? How dare you? Who do you think you are? Sit down and shut up as I audit your stupid little dream. And really what they're saying is, me? <laughs> Mom, look, I built a rocket ship. <laughs> and so, so many of us come from that where people even, you know, and I don't judge people because so many people that, that try to help you out in life, they're doing the best they can. And that's the problem. Without the Holy Ghost, our best is not enough. You know, people that are sitting in prison today, they did the best they could. <laughs> people that have, <laughs> people that have, have, have murdered or they've uh, gone out uh, unfaithfully in their marriages or whatever, they did the best they could. <laughs> But the bottom line is, without the Holy Spirit, all of our best leads to meh. <laughs> okay, anyway, let me come back to this. Yeah, I don't know. I, I just, <laughs> this, you know what you got to do? You got to do what God's put in your heart to do and do with all your heart, because at the end of your life, you're only going to give an account to one, only to one, only to one. And that is Jesus Christ, the Lord. You're going to give an account to him. And your life matters. I need you. We need you. Other people that are viewing this right now need you in this army, in this family, to fulfill your high call and hit your prophetic destiny. And if you do not, all of us suffer for it. And you know the, the mom in that show that's like, meh, you know what she was? She's somebody that probably had a dream when she's younger, told it to a dream auditor, <laughs> somebody that's like, you know, uh, anyway, <laughs> the, uh, you know, the native tongue of the uninspired is criticism. Write that down. The native tongue of the uninspired is criticism, but the native tongue of God is always clarity. There's something inside you that God has called you to do, and, and the devil didn't put it there. Did you know that a lot of times people get condemned for wanting to be um, somebody or famous even? The problem is, it's just like the love of money. Money itself is not evil. It's when people love money that they get pulled off the wrong pathway. But if people have a desire to be known or do things, it's probably because God's putting in an anointing on them to influence. It's just you got to check that and make sure that that's in check as an act of worship to the Lord and that you just sacrifice and, and put that, that desire on the altar. When you begin to do that, God will help you. He'll manifest things through you. Maybe you have a desire to make a lot of money. A lot of money. That means you probably have a gift of giving inside you. You understand? God gives you those desires not for your own hoarded, you know, self-inflated ego that you want to just put it towards. It's so you can help the kingdom and fulfill a role in the body of Christ. That's what this stuff's about. That's why we do it. Whatever those desires are, there's people that say, I have a desire to be married. Amen. That's so you can have a, a high calling with God and raise up a godly legacy for the kingdom. Your desires are not bad, but can you righteously fulfill your desires is the question. You need to write that down. Can I righteously fulfill my desires? And if the answer is yes, well, then God gave it to you. God gave it to you. And a lot of times we're quick to dismiss things when we just need to sanctify those desires. I hope that makes sense. Praise God. That was for somebody, I'm telling you. That, that hit the target somewhere. Now, what, real quick, when we're looking at this prophetic destiny, your purpose, time, here's what happens. Now, we've talked about this before, but it's very worth talking about. Again, many times when we get going, 
People start out in the journey and they say, I'm starting out on that straight line because I see influencers and what I'm supposed to be doing and I'm going to be just like that. But what happens is, is life happens. You get smacked by life. So you start, yay, going up and then down, up and down, up and down. And you might go over here, up and down, right? Up and down, up and, and you have life that's filled with ups and downs. And anybody who says that's not true hasn't lived very much. This is what you call mountains and valleys, <laughs> right? And you have these, but you don't have to change in the middle of it because Hebrews chapter six, it's just through faith and patience you endure and you receive the promises. That means in a mountaintop experience or a valley experience, you are the same. Now, this is important. Time happens. So when you got this on the mind over here, you've got this vision on your brain and you're trying to go through life, but time keeps smacking you as you're looking at this with your mind, your heart, your desires. Time keeps smacking you and many people can get taken out by the adversary of time. I call this actually, this is a good description of the seed war. You have a vision and a purpose. You know, you, you know what you're supposed to do and you're going towards it, but time is not giving it to you as quickly as you want. This works in sowing and reaping. This works in vision. It works in all of it. And seed war is this right here. This whole part right here, dun, 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 that's the seed war. This whole place here. Seed war, this is where it is. I sowed, I believed, and I have not received yet. This is the seed war. Win this. Win this, and you'll hit your destiny. Okay? So when we're looking at this, the problem, however, is in the middle of a seed war, is that also... Many times people get distracted. What do I mean? They get distracted by the worries of life, the desire for other things, riches, whatever it is, wrong relationships, you know, uh, uh, guilt relationships, just stuff that you're, you're putting your bandwidth towards you shouldn't. Or it could be success itself. Sometimes people chase the logical thing they should do and in the beginning they're you know they're even making money they're succeeding and they're like look at this look it's not that bad you know they see your life wow all over here and they're watching this and they're saying gosh what is your problem i'm just kind of doing my thing and they're going down this avenue and suddenly they get to here and they say see i hit my target See how amazing I am? I've done it. And now I'm here and I got relationships and my kids and all the things. And now sometimes the very enemy of destiny, the very enemy of destiny can be a good life. It could be a good job. People are like, really? Well, look, I, I believe in you got to provide for people. I believe you got to take care of your family if you're a person. If you don't know what to do, make money. Go work. But if you have an inkling that God's called you, then you do these things to do this. But if you make it all about your life, here's the classic example. I was a youth pastor many years ago. And um, I, can, I can say this. I was a youth pastor many years ago. And I remember um, parents had come to me and they'd say, oh, Joseph, you know, Pastor Joseph at the time, you know, we'd have our kids be in these prayer meetings with you and, and, and trying to figure out, you know, their destiny and calling and stuff and really in the Word of God. But, you know, they got like hockey camp or they got sports or they got, you know, all that stuff. And I would just say to them, well, you know, I, I can't tell you what to do. You're the parent. But I highly recommend you get their spiritual development in order. They could play sports and do all that stupid stuff anytime. And, um, and you know, go do all those things. And I'd rather they knew the living God and had a long-term relationship with them than play the things. And I'm for sports. I think it's great. But I think a lot of people sacrifice their children children on the altar of sports rather than bring them to the, the Holy of Holies and turn them into people of God. And they'll chase it. And then one day, I remember specifically, it happened over and over again through the seasons I was pastoring. I remember parents would come to me and be like, you know, my kids, they're just, they don't serve God. They're, they're just kind of chasing stuff. They're, you know, like doing drugs and sleeping around. And I don't know what's going on. I'm like, you know what you should do? And I was, of course, very young and immature. I said, you should take them to sports camp. <laughs> sports camp, you know, like you did before, you should take them to sports camp. That'll fix it, right? <laughs> And now, today I have a lot of compassion for people wherever they are, now that I'm a little older and wiser with those kind of stupid comments I would make. But the reason I would say that is because people would put God on the back burner and put that stuff on the front burner, and then when life hits, that can't help them. Now, a little bit different, but the same principle is, 
a lot of people will move across the country. I'm talking move their whole life for the good life, a good job. They don't seek first the kingdom, right? Matthew chapter 6, 33, it says seek first the kingdom, right? First the kingdom. And his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. In other words, the little known fact is if you're willing to go through this, woo, the call of God, but you're seeking God, you're serving the Lord, you go through this, the hidden result is, is you're going to get all this too. But you got to seek this first. If you'll do the difficult, which is this rodeo of going after your destiny, which means praying, seeking the Lord, being with the right people, sacrificing things, doing what counts for eternity always, God, as a knee-jerk reaction, and his word is not false, it will not lie. If you seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, all of this comes with it anyway. That's the little hidden agenda that God has for his people. He wants to be worshipped. He wants to know you. He wants you to seek him first. And when you do that, all these other things will be added unto 